Hello and welcome to the Today's Homeowner Weekly Podcast. We're here to help you with the challenges we all face as homeowners. I'm Danny Lifford. And I'm Joe Truini. And each week, Danny and I are here on the podcast to answer any and all home improvement questions. And we want to hear from you. Send us your questions or comments at todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. Today's Homeowner Podcast is brought to you by The Home Depot. How doers get more done. From installing a smart garage door opener to installing a bathroom faucet to removing a tree, The Home Depot believes you can do anything, especially the things we have how-to guides for. Visit homedepot.com for thousands of tips, workshops, and ideas for projects, big and small. The Home Depot app, how doers get more done. This week, we look at some solutions to some problems with a brand new laminate floor. Also, share with you how important it is to rake that snow from your roof to keep it from building up. Now, a lot of people are trying to get organized around their home, including their garage. How do you get started? And we're going to share some tips with you on how to do that and how to make it a success. Calcium buildup is something nobody wants in the shower. We'll tell you how to remove it. And Joe, what about that simple solution you have for us? All right, Danny, I have a quick fix for removing a damaged peel and stick vinyl floor tile. All right, plenty to share with you, so let's get started. Tell you what, Joe, I've um, got my hands full over the next couple days, headed up to Birmingham, Alabama, where two of my daughters live. And of course, they have significant list for dad to take care of so <laughs> okay so i talked to him you know and i, I you know wanted to get the two different lists because now i'm having to balance that so i'm putting one day in right. at one at one of my daughter's houses and one day in at my other daughter who just bought her very first house so you know they're excited about the little things that they, they they know how to do it they're putting their list in order of priority and then they know i'm going to ask okay do you have this material do you have that And, you know, Melanie, my middle daughter, who just got married recently, as you know, told me something I've never heard quite put this way before. What's that? I said, well, well, do you have the drill? Do do you have the drill bitch? Yes, I've got I've got that. Do you have, you know, the flat bar? Do you have the cords and things? Yeah. yeah." She said, Dad, I'm married into tools, so I've got plenty of tools. And I go, what what you say? I've never heard anybody. You know, you hear the old saying about, well, she married into money. Right. right. Well, she's kind of chuckling at it. She goes, Dad. I'm married into tools because her husband is in construction business, so right. he's got plenty of tools, so um, I don't have to take any tools up there. Oh, good. I was assured that she'd have everything I need. Married into tools. Sounds like a, sounds like a movie title, maybe. We'll, we'll have to work yeah, on that. Yeah, it might be. <laughs> if you'd like to reach out to us, we make it really easy. 800-946-4420 is the Today's Homeowner Hotline. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You're able to ask us any question you like, and you also can um, any, leave any comment or any thought that you may have that you want us to cover on the Today's Homeowner Radio Show. You can send us emails anytime, todayshomeowner.com slash ask. Right now we're going to go to New Hampshire. We get a lot of wonderful calls from that great state. And Ken is on the line. Ken, welcome to the show. And uh, tell us what's going on uh, around your house. Hi, guys. I uh, love your show. My wife and I have built a new home. And we installed Pergo Outlast laminate flooring in the main part of the house. And now the issue we're having is some of the planks have separated on the ends, not on the, the, the long side, but just on the ends. And I'm not sure why that's happening. And I was concerned about is how much of a job it will be to uh, reconnect those planks. Now, Ken, this is a traditional floating laminate floor, so nothing is glued down to the floor. That's correct. Well, you know, normally what happens there is that it's a matter of shrinkage, that it's just uh, the material is installed, and then after air conditioning and heat and the relative humidity in the home goes down to you know, what is usually an accepted level of 35 to 50 percent. A lot of times um, materials will shrink just a little bit and it'll show up in the end, the butt joints, more so than it will the long joints. And that's, I assume, what's happened here because it's not likely it's any type of movement in the floor or anything along those lines. You know, um, I have seen situations where you're able to take, um, you know, go to one end. Now, you might have to take some shoe molding down in order to use a flat bar to squeeze these things back in. But as strange as it sounds, and this this is going to seem, seem a little odd, but I have done it personally, and that is with a pair of tennis shoes on, 
you're able to kind of scoot that board back together. It depends on how long it is, and but you're actually able to just kind of jump and push that board. Um, it's, it, we, we used to kid around about stretching carpet that way, but you actually can do that. I know it sounds a little funny, and you certainly will look funny when you do it, but um, that possibly can tighten those joints back up together. My concern is I'd have to remove baseboards and well, the major problems are right near the entry door, so I, I understand the temperature change and the shrinkage there probably when you open the door. and It's cold here. I mean, it's 29 degrees today. Uh, and I don't know if that makes any difference or whether it seems the main problems are where the runs are the longest. Uh, the house is 48 feet long, and on the sides, these planks are running probably... 36 feet. I don't know if the length of the run makes any difference. Well, it would. There's just more material there and more that can shrink. There's a, um, you know, some, you know, the thing about it, either it's going to go together very easily or it may be near impossible to do without replace, without removing the shoe molding or the baseboard in order to pry against the wall. Joe, any tips on this? Yeah, Ken, what I would suggest, and it, first of all, this is not unusual with laminate flooring, and thankfully it's not along the edge, the long edge, because that's a separate issue altogether. And the way I've found, uh, you can try Danny's uh, tennis shoe technique and see if that works. If you have a lot of boards, a lot of planks, and you have to move a lot of them, you may wear out your shoes before you get everything back in place. But um, if they don't move, what you can do is take a, about a 12 foot long, 12 foot, 12 inch long two by four and put a piece of double stick tape on the bottom, then stick it down to the plank that you want to move. Then just tap it with a hammer. You know, put, put your foot on it, by the way, stand on top of that two by four so it doesn't move. Just tap it. That'll usually move. Now, of course, when it moves, it's going to create a gap at the other end. So you have to do, you know, if this one's three planks from the end of the wall, you have to move three planks because you're going to move them all. And you can actually try if this isn't, if the joints aren't too tightly together, which they should be, but if they will move, you might be able to move, you know, go back two or three planks and tap it and see if it moves two or three planks to close that gap. And if you're really lucky, any remaining gap will be under your shoe molding. Excellent. Right? Because as you as you said, you don't want to really remove the shoe molding if you don't have to. Right. So there should be a gap around the room anyway. It should be a quarter inch gap. The shoe molding should be at least five eighths of an inch. So you would have room to move it. Right. Um, to where you wouldn't see the gap now under the shoe. All right, I'll, I'll try those uh, techniques, and hopefully I can get this accomplished without removing uh, baseboard thresholds. Good. Well, we certainly hope so. I think you'll, you'll find that it'll work pretty well, and then the good thing about it is once you get it corrected, it's not likely to happen again now that it's got acclimated to your house. So best of luck on that, and we appreciate you being a part of the show today. Well, thank you very much, and I, I do love your show, and I uh, will listen to you regularly. Thanks much. All righty. Thanks so much, Ken. We appreciate that. Well, Joe, your your idea with the double stick tape probably would work okay, but not near as much fun as getting the tennis <laughs> shoes and doing a little jig on that floor yeah. like that. And, you know, you can put whatever music I would recommend. You know, a, oh, right. a, you know something a faster music. I mean, right. the not a soft shoe. Perry Como um, thing might not might not Perry do it. Como, how far <laughs> down did you reach in your memory bank to come up with Perry Como? <laughs> Wow. I just always like that name, Como. Yeah, that is that's a kind pretty, of a cool name. That's pretty good. <laughs> sounds like an abbreviation. I suspect that was a longer name. But with Ken's problem being a brand new house, there also, of course, is a lot of movement in a brand new house as everything's starting to settle and release moisture and everything else. And if this flooring wasn't acclimated to the room, as you had um, referred earlier, you know, because whenever you bring in new flooring, it should always sit in the room in its original packaging. I'm not really sure why that is, but it shouldn't be open. It should be sitting in its original packaging for up to two weeks or so. I don't know how it acclimates when it's wrapped in plastic, but anyway, that's what the manufacturers recommend. Well, I tell you what, I, I went to extremes here on my new house when um, acclimating everything, including the trim, because so often, you know, you'll install crown mold and I've got lots and lots of trim in the house. And I didn't want to have all of those gaps. So right. as soon as I got my windows and doors in, um, and of course, one of the doors I had a special order, I had to wait a while, I, I put up two layers of plastic there. I put a dehumidifier in the center of the house. I put a, a drain line going straight into one of my drains. And I kept that thing running 24 hours a day. I know it cost me wow. a little bit in electricity because dehumidifiers will We'll use a lot of electricity, but I kept that going the entire time. And I had, of course, a hygrometer to check to Good. make sure I was keeping Good. it down yeah. below 50%. So anything that I brought in, I brought in early. I brought in thousands of feet of trim. I brought in all of my doors, all of my millwork, all of my floors, everything in there. And I knew that it would stay dry. And I made everybody keep the doors, you know, closed. Right. And it, it was pretty warm in there sometimes, like a dehumidifier will do. But I'm telling you now, a year and a half, two years later, I don't see any 
any separation in my floors and oh, my molding and my and some of this crown molding so seven and eight inches which has a lot of wood there sure so yeah. um, i'm telling you that little going to that extreme will certainly save you you know a lot of trouble down the road yeah and plus you had a brand new slab floor port and those are continuously releasing moisture That's right. as well yeah. mm-hmm. um, more than you might think so oh uh, yeah any like you said anything you can do to get that moisture out of the house um, will work out in your favor in the long run yeah no doubt about it just a few of those little things like that certainly can make a big, big difference. Here's another email from Mike in Rochester, New York. A large section of my asphalt shingle roof has a 3 and 12 pitch. With all the snow we get here in upstate New York, I was wondering, should I rake the snow off the roof or let nature take its course? I'm a bit worried about ice down. So, okay, Snow Joe, should it stay or should it go? <laughs> so this is a 3 12 pitch roof, I think he said. So uh-huh. that's pretty flat. It's only about, I think, 3 12 is about 14 degrees or so. Yes, he should definitely break the snow off. Now, this is assuming he can safely reach the roof from the ground. I wouldn't recommend getting up even on a ladder if the ground's covered with snow and ice. But I have a roof rake, and it has, I don't know, like a 16-foot-long handle, so you can probably reach it. And you, you only need to pull the snow off the bottom four to six feet of roof, and that'll help prevent ice dams because what happens is the, the snow melts and it runs down the roof under the snow, hits the, the eave of the house, which is cold, and it freezes. And then the rest of the snow melting doesn't have any place to go, and it backs up. And that ice forms a dam, which is why I call it an ice dam. And it backs up and gets under the shingles, believe it or not, goes up the roof and will leak into the house. So, yes, if you can, definitely pull the snow off the roof. And I'll tell you, those snow rigs are pretty neat. I mean, they yeah. you know, they can telescope out. Just, I mean, I think I used one one time that was 20 foot long wow. and very light, lightweight, and you just lay it there, and, you know, you might not get 100% of the snow off, but you're getting the majority of the Most weight. Of so yeah. good one there. Here's another email from Dylan in uh, Gillette, Florida. Hi, Danny. I heard you discussing the importance of changing the rotation of ceiling fans during winter. Can you tell me which position the switch is supposed supposed to be in to circulate the heat. Well, Dylan, I don't know if it's up or if it's down, but what you want is for it to be turning clockwise is the most important part of it. As you're looking up at the fan, it should be turning clockwise to push the air up toward the ceiling. And as I've mentioned a number of times, I mean, if you've ever been up on a ladder doing some work uh, in any room, any time of the year, it's a lot hotter up there near the ceiling than it is down where you're walking around on the floor. So pushing that hot air and having it return turn back to the lower part of the room just makes sense as far as your comfort level always use it on low you don't want to you know to to push it too hard but you do that and i guarantee you'll immediately see a big difference all of these were emails that came in at today's homeowner.com slash ask and you can do the same thing joe what about that simple solution come on all right i have a quick tip on removing a damaged peel and stick floor tile without damaging any other tiles that's the key i mean you know, sometimes you can use a pretty aggressive method and you wind up damaging another tile and now, you know, the problem's compounded. So first thing you do is cover the damaged tile with two layers of paper towel, just dry paper towel, then set a hot clothes iron on top of the paper towels. No steam, just the hot setting without the steam. And just slowly move it back and forth. And what you're doing, of course, you're heating up that tile, which will loosen up the adhesive below. So move it around. I mean, depending on how old this tile is, it might take five or six minutes you know if it's a relatively new tile that you got you put down might only take a couple of minutes but in any case move it around and then slip a putty knife under one corner and see if it's starting to loosen up and little by little you'll see that the glue will release and you can peel up that tile and replace it what we're trying to do is make let that surface uh dry you need to clean it before you stick down the new tile and by the way the other tip if you're just starting a tile project and you want to use these peel and sticks as Danny said they're really easy to put down you they're lightweight you move one at a time but the big advantage is exactly that Danny if there's a stain or a damage or scratched up or uh, sometimes tables and chairs leave dents that don't come out you can just remove those one or two tiles but if you're going to buy them buy the best you quality the highest price ones you can afford because the cheap ones are not really square Not to mention they're thin and they wear out, but they're not square. And that's the biggest thing. When you start laying these together, if they're not perfectly square, you end up with these tapered gaps between them that there's no way to fix. So 
So that's the other solution is to buy really good peel and stick tiles. Buying just a few extra ones All because them. if you try to go back and and match them later, you'll have a you know a different run that will maybe be slightly different, uh, or they discontinue them constantly. So just having two or three extra ones there are a, are a great idea, and that goes for just about anything that you have in your house. I know when I built my new house, of course I had tile left over, I had trim left over, and and that's really the only thing that I have stored in my garage um, attic area is just the different little components here and there. And even though I've only been in here a short amount of time, I have gone in and gotten a few things here and there that I needed. And uh, it's uh, become very, very valuable. You, you hate to pay, you know, buy too much and have too much left over because of the cost. But having a few pieces here and there and making sure that you save them and label them definitely makes a lot of difference there. So, Well, the days of buying extra lumber because it was relatively affordable, if you need an extra board, or two, it doesn't matter. Now I see when I go into Home Depot, people are wheeling lumber back in. Yeah, oh yeah. Because they've bought two or three boards too much. It's like, well, these these studs are 10 or 12 bucks each. I'm not going to just let them lay around. Well, it's just like some of these deck screws. I mean, uh, these, these really good deck screws, $27 for, I guess it's a five pound box. And I know we're talking to my daughter because I'm going there this weekend to do some work. She said, says, how many screws will you need? And I yeah. went, well, let's see. <laughs> I guess I'll need probably about 15. She goes, good. I have 20. I'm taking the other box back. So that's a good, <laughs> good example. I mean, why not 27 bucks? That's I mean, right. You know, if you have some leftover screws and nails, it's kind of nice to keep them around, but not when it's almost 30 bucks a box. That's right. Yeah. Well, I have an old uh, Ace Hardware store not far from here where you can still buy in individual screws. No kidding. Big there you go. So if you want to buy one screw, you can buy one screw. <laughs> the sound of you doing is music to our ears. Order on the Home Depot app and get convenient delivery so you don't have to stop doing when you need something. The Home Depot app, how doers get more done time for our best new product segment brought to you by the Home Depot. How doers get more done. If you've ever had a light switch or a receptacle that was recessed into the wall a little too far, you know how annoying it can be. It leaves a gap between the device and the cover plate that is definitely not very attractive and can really make you a little nervous every time that you use this. A lot of times this can happen when you're installing a ceramic backsplash in your kitchen and how do you really support that outlet or that device properly? Well, Rayco invented the flush fit wall plate spacer to solve the problem. Flush fit wall plate spacer. The metal plate simply hooks behind the device and over the top mounting screw. Then it swings down behind the device to draw it out from the wall and hold it in the proper position for the cover plate. It works on any kind of switch, receptacle, GFCI, in single gang boxes to repair loose or recessed devices. So if you have sloppy switches or outlets and you just don't want to put up with them anymore, you can fix it with this particular device. So again, it's a Ranko One Gang Flush Fit Wall Plate Spacer. And you can find out more by going to homedepot.com. We get asked that all the time with questions about people installing the quarter inch or three eighths inch thick ceramic and they get to the outlets and you just don't right. know what to do. So yeah. there's the solution right there for you. Now, if you want to send us an email, you can do so at todayshomeowner.com slash ask. And if you want to pick up the phone 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 800-946-4420. Joe, we got some great calls that came in on the hotline, so I think we need to, to jump right on them and grab one right now. Okay, let's go. I recently did a bathroom remodel and installed a shower and a bath exhaust fan. Uh, the bath exhaust fan I installed uh, is for a 100 square foot bathroom and this one is only 50 square feet because I wanted to make sure I'd remove enough moisture out of it. The venting pipe I used flex pipe insulated and that runs about 20 feet across the attic and I have it coming out of a south side wall with a plastic hooded single flap damper. Uh, the weather has sometimes been around 20 below zero and that flapper will freeze down. And if I run the fan long enough, it, it'll thaw and open up. But the next day, I repeat the process. And if it really gets cold and 30 below, it will not open up. Uh, my question is, uh, is there any remedy to this? Or would it help to add blanket insulation on top of the flex pipe in addition to the pipe being insulated? 
Thanks. Wow, that, you're talking about some extreme cold when you're talking yeah. about 15 to 30 degrees below zero. And I know exactly what he's talking about. First of all, it sounds like he's done everything right. Um, now, to have a vent pipe to go 20 feet in any situation, it'd be a lot better if it was a lot shorter route because the longer that exhaust line is, the vent pipe, the less efficient that it'll be. But, um, of course, he's got it insulated. So, Joe, that little flapper, you know, that's just usually um, either very, very thin aluminum or right. a lot of times it can be plastic. Um, do you know of any trick in order with those kind of extremes to keep that thing from sticking like that? Because you have, you know, you're, you're exhausting moisture out, so there's bound right. to be you know, a, a little bit of moisture on the flap at all times, just about. Sure. And then all of a sudden it freezes. Uh, any thoughts on that? Well, you're right. That 20 foot run is compounding the problem because it, the heat has dissipated at that point. So it's not warm air exiting that flap or that damper. Because at that point, after 20 feet, I'm sure that warm air from the bathroom is cooled considerably. So it's not keeping that damper warm at all. The only thing I've found that works, and I had this one problem, and the reason you want to keep it open, besides the fact that, you know, it's not exhausting the air properly, is that's putting strain on the motor. I mean, if, if that flapper is closed, this motor's running, the fan motor's running, trying to push that air, and it's not going anywhere. Um, it's probably leaking out a little bit, but not it's not flowing out smoothly. I would put, if you can get to this damper during the really cold part of winter, just put a little piece of something plastic or a wooden stick or anything to keep it from closing entirely now the the downside is of course that you know you have a little bit of air leakage through there maybe cold air coming up but that's the only thing i know is to keep it from closing all the way so it won't seal which is basically freezing shut you know so that's the only thing i would suggest and he only needs maybe a quarter inch something like a quarter inch Maybe you drive in a screw someplace to keep the flapper from, I'm calling it a flapper, it's the damper, from f going closed all the way. Um, so I burned out a uh, vent fan on my range hood one time from that exact thing. It froze shut, and the fan was running and running and running, and, it, you know, all the times we were using it, I don't know how long it took. It probably took a, you know, a few weeks or a couple of months, but it did eventually burn out the motor. And that was only going, you know, through the walls, eight inches not 20 feet. It doesn't sound like the vent cover uh, would be very accessible if it was accessible and you can anticipate some of that. You know, some of the de-ice or even some of the material that's used like on windshields could be sprayed on it. I think um might be able to do it, but I would guess it is hard to get to, but maybe propping it open as you're suggesting, or if it's, uh, it, you know, available that he would be able to spray that, but pretty unique problem there. Yeah, it is. And I know there's high temperature grease. And I suspect there's probably it's like low temperature grease, which is less viscous. And maybe if you smeared some of that around, it would prevent it from freezing. I'm not really sure. If you're living in a place that gets down to 20 or 30 below, I suspect there are materials that can be used in extreme weather like that. That's right. Let's go right back to the today's homeowner hotline. Yes, Danny. Uh, I have a little situation. Pretty sure I've got a lot of calcium and lime build up in the bottom of my shower stall. I've tried scrubbing it with a pretty substantial scrub brush with uh, bleach, and I also squirted a little bit of toilet bowl cleaner, because I know toilet bowl cleaner, all that stuff has got uh, a little bit of phosphoric acid, but uh, I just wonder if anything else would take care of the lime and calcium. Okay, then. Well, it is definitely a big um, big problem. You hear about that a lot. We get a lot of calls and emails about that. Um, I know the one, one of the products that we've used in the past, Joe, is, uh, I think, Lime Away. Lime Away and CLR. Right, yeah. Which is which stands for calcium lime rust remover. Uh -huh, so uh -huh. either of those. I know he said he tried bleach, but bleach is the wrong product for that. For the calcium, you'd want to use distilled white vinegar. Spray it on the, the floor of the shower. Let it sit 15 minutes or so. Spray it again. Let it keep it soaked. And then scrub it with a scouring sponge. You know, kind of with like the little uh, nylon Brillo pad on it. And then uh, reapply the vinegar if you need to. Um, scrub it again, then wash it. And for any areas that you need to get in that the sponge won't reach, use an old toothbrush dipped in vinegar. Something that I never realized that, of course, we talk about white vinegar all the time, but you brought up a number of times the, the high test, high test <laughs> vinegar. <laughs> That's that right. Actually, I believe you said it was like 30% versus whatever normal vinegar is. Yeah, normal vinegar, I think like 6 or 8% acidity. Yeah, yeah. So when you talk about really 
attacking something, you know, like a shower and everything, that might, that work, might yeah. be worthwhile. Because the thing about it is you're not using gallons and gallons of this stuff no, when you're no. doing a cleaning project like that. Yeah. You'd be lucky if you used a half a cup or a full cup on, on a shower, depending on how big the shower is. But that would definitely work. If it didn't work, then you can go try uh, Lime Away or CLR. Okay, let's go right back to the hotline for another call. You were my answer to my prayers today. You ran the recipe for removing wallpaper. I have vinyl wallpaper. The first coat has come off. The backing is still on the wall. You gave a way to remove it with your solution. I had it all copied down except for I got down to diff. And I didn't have the rest of it. Can you repeat it, please? Thank you so much. Right. We're (laughs) certainly glad to do that because it really is an effective way. And we've shared this with a lot of homeowners over the years and have used it many, many times. I'm telling you, it will make life a lot easier when you're there about to remove that wallpaper. One layer, two layers, or three layers as we often take out. So I'm going to give you this. But remember, you can go to todayshomeowner.com anytime and just put in wallpaper remover in our internal search and it'll print everything out there. And you can also, while you're there, look at all of the videos and everything that you need. But here comes the recipe again. It starts with three gallons of hot water. And of course, you're putting all of this in a pump-up sprayer. 22-ounce bottle of Diff. Now, Diff is a wallpaper remover solution, and you use that as part of this formula. Then a quarter cup of fabric softener. We found that that helps it to stick to the wall or stick to wherever you're taking that wallpaper off and allow these the other parts of this to work. Next one, one cup of white vinegar, and last, two tablespoons of baking soda. You just put this in the, the pump-up sprayer, shake it up real good, and then really use it uh, very, very liberally. Just keep pouring it on there and pouring it on there. Um, it's really going to help a lot. And as we've also recommended, using a lightweight plastic, painter's plastic, and just stick it to the wall. It's going to stay on the wall. You don't need any tape or anything because the moisture is going to help it adhere it. And it just basically allows all of the chemicals to work not really chemicals, but um, things you would find in your pantry to work away at all of that glue so that it will come down. And then just a little bit of persuasion with a six inch um, drywall knife and you're ready to to go back with more wallpaper, more paint, uh, faux finish, whatever you want to go with there, you're able to strip it all down. And again, you can find that and anything that we talk about, you can find it at Today's Homeowner Dot com. Right now, we're headed to Atlanta, where Scott is on the line. Scott, welcome to the show, and tell us what's going on around your house there. Hey, I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. A uh, little backstory. My wife and I went through a remodel of our house, first floor, uh, back over the summer. And at that time, we had transitioned a bunch of furniture and other things out of the house into the garage. And since then, we have a two-car garage, and we have a couple little kids and all of the stuff that comes with life. And we've been able to recapture one of the garage spots, but we haven't been able to capture the second. And our garage really is kind of a mishmash. Unfortunately, we don't have a basement. So it's, it's kind of become our storage slash car parking spot slash workout area. And it's just, it's a jumbled mess. Um, I would, I'm one of those weird folks. I'd love to be able to park my cars in the garage again. Um, but we need storage, storage ideas. Um, but we don't have a lot of room. So it's, we're kind of in this weird place right now where it's like, well, what do we do now? What do we do next? That's why we reached out to the show and hoping to maybe get some ideas and, and see what we can do. Well, what I'm looking at in the pictures, and I appreciate you sending that, is not the worst garage I've seen. So you, you've, uh, you've got some, you, you've got a <laughs> yeah, good opportunity here. At least you can here. park one car. We've seen where you can't park yeah. either car. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Without, without a doubt. But I see a lot of things here. One thing I see here that uh, kind of stands out to me, which I think is, is, I think I know the reason for this, looks like you have a cabinet there that's probably about five foot tall, and you have a strap around it i assume that is for to keep uh, the kids from tilting that over yeah it is good um that's become kind of a, a tool storage area um for us as well as you know screws nails things like that things that we just don't want them to get into sure well i com- i commend you for that because that's something the the tilt over issues is something that a lot of people don't think about um you know in large pieces of furniture stoves 
um, you know, d- different things inside your home that, you know, kids will pull those drawers out and use that as a ladder to, to, to get up and tilt right over. So, so great idea on that. Well, first of all, when you, you know, um, you, you know, the first thing I'm going to mention in terms of garage is throw away as much as you can, throw away, donate, whatever you can and purge as much as you can out of there. Only you and your wife can do that. Nobody else can. Uh, but after that, um, then trying to get as much of the material and and, uh, and the possessions off the floor is also the key thing. So, you know, to um, you can go buy all kinds of metal and different types of pre-made type of garage things. And you can go online and you can look at all of these different ideas, but some of them are like building expensive cabinetry in your house and that's not what you need or want out in the garage. I'll tell you so many times I've used half inch plywood and regular um, two by fours and created 16 inch wide shelving and 16 inch wide shelving will just about take care of everything and you can get three uh, cuts or three runs out of one sheet of plywood so that you're, you're talking about one sheet of plywood will create a shelf that's 16 inches wide and 24 feet long so won't take too many pieces of plywood nor too many pieces of two by four uh, in order to um, get a lot of this material up off the ground now with your doorways most doors like this and what i'm seeing is you have about 12 to 14 inches above the door that's an ideal place to position the shelf directly on top of the door trim that will allow you to go across the door without interrupting it all along the back wall and then maybe even over um, around where the window is in that um, part of the garage. That alone was probably 30 feet of shelving. And then by the time you put everything up, and, and I like to I like to paint the shelving. I usually paint it the same as the walls. Have it up there. Then underneath there, you're able to hang your ladder. You're able to hang uh, bicycles. You're able to hang a lot of things that you might need more ready access to. You have places to tuck your step ladder under. And just that simple one shelf running around there like that probably will solve the majority of your problems in here after you purge a few things. Now, which one is, who's the pack rat in the family, you or, or your wife? Uh, it's It's more of her. Ah. She's, not, she's not here to defend herself so i'm gonna say it's her <laughs> <laughs> that's what i thought you were going to do but but um but but what i'm describing here i mean i, I don't know how um how how well how comfortable you are in, in building shelving like that but it, we we have lots of information on our website and it really is a pretty simple thing especially if you get her or a friend to help you on holding it in place and so forth because a lot of it you can build right on the ground hold it up put screws in it some supports on it and you're ready to go yeah, no, those are, that's a great idea. I didn't even think of, you know, coming, it, it's coming from the top down rather than from the floor up. Sure, yeah. And, and, and that's also a, good, a key thing that if you're able to prevent any supports from the floor itself is just a lot better. That is easier to keep clean. It's easier to, that gives you more floor space. Get everything up off that floor that you possibly can. And always think when you're organizing things, Put uh, those things that you use the most, let those be, um, you know, the most accessible things that you get. So think about that when you're putting your, your totes in there, hanging things underneath. And uh, But if you get that first shelf done and get it up, then you'll see some odds and ends that you can adapt here and there on different areas of the garage. Okay, that's great. No, I appreciate it. That's a great idea. Well, if you get in the middle of it and get stumped in any way, you know what to do. Just give us a call back. We'll be glad to guide you through it at any time. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. Take care. All right. Take care, Scott. It sounds like Scott is headed straight out to go, to go to work on all of that. Yeah, you're right, though. The first thing to do is purge. You know, you just have to throw out as much as you can because he's got this out of the house. A lot of it is piled up in bags. Obviously, they don't need it that often that they can't maybe purge some of this. And any really large items, I see he has a large extension ladder and some bicycles. If you can find someplace else to store those, because how often are you going to use the extension ladder? Um, you know, that will free up a lot of space too, because it's hanging on the wall now, which is great, but that takes up like when it's collapsed, he's probably taking up 12 feet of wall space. So, um, anything like that, store it outside. It is so satisfying when you get uh, something organized. And matter of fact, we're going in the aisles of the Home Depot with our buddy, Danny Watson. Danny, I'll tell you something that is so gratifying, especially seems like this time of the year, is getting certain areas of your home organized. It just gives you so much back over the year. Danny, you're 
Right. And I got to tell you, I just finished my, personally finished my closet at my house. I redid it. Oh, is that right? And <laughs> Well, and I was thinking about it, which really makes this timely. You know, before the grass starts growing and we start gardening, this is such a good time to tackle these things inside where it's warm. But I didn't realize how happy I could be with having the closet and the shoes and all that. Well, it affects you like uh, every morning when I when I walk into my walk-in closet. I don't want stuff all over the place. I want it to right. at least Easy. appear organized, you know? Exactly. No, it's, <laughs> it's the little things that make life better. I agree. Our winter storage event's going on right now. It runs through February the 27th, and you can save up to 25% off on storage and organization solutions. Stuff's going to be things, you know, like bike racks and uh, garage cabinets, select laundry organization, shelving, and so much more. So you want to take advantage of that. Well, you know, when you get in the aisles there and you start looking at all of the organizational things that you have there, and of course all the storage bins, all the totes, everything you have there, you can really kind of put together your plan while you're there. If you, you know, you, you got to look at your garage, look at your attic, look at the space, your closet and so forth a little bit ahead of time and, and maybe a little drawing here and there. But boy, when you get in the aisles, it seems to all come together for you. It really does. And I was looking at actually some of the totes this morning that we've got in, some of the really nice heavy duty ones that come with wheels and makes it so much easier, especially if you're going to be storing like heavy things. You can go ahead and fill that and then roll it out to the garage. And some of these are built really nicely. So when you stack them, you don't have to worry about the walls of the tote getting compromised. They just seem like they hold up so much better. And since they're on sale, it's a great time to pick them up. And you know, a lot of the shelving units, people might get a little intimidated trying to get you know, two by fours and plywood and putting everything together. But these freestanding units now, you have some of them that can handle just about as much weight as you want to put on them. You're right. And they're really, they're, they're really easy to put together. I put a few together myself right after Christmas and they're simple to install, but yet they hold a lot of weight. Danny, I also want to throw in there, I know sometimes this can be overwhelming to some folks or maybe they're just too busy. So keep in mind that at HomeDepot.com slash services, we do offer design and installation, custom closets, storage solutions, you know, for the person that's just might not have time or don't want to tackle it. You can also leave it up to us. But, you know, the home services team, you know, you're taking advantage of the expertise of, hey, we've done this before. We had a situation like this. Here's what worked out great. Instead of feeling like you're maybe experimenting with some of the plans or some of the ideas that you may or may not have, that's where it really comes in handy to have the pros from Home Depot kind of, we've been there, we've done that, we know it's going to work well for you. And they'll help you maximize the space that you have. Great project, always gratifying. Always great to talk to you, Danny, and I know that you're busy there in the aisles getting everybody organized, so keep up the good work. Thank you so much, Danny. Good to be on. That's absolutely true, Danny. Whether it's a bedroom closet or a two-car garage, you know, staying organized is... First of all, it makes your life a lot easier, but you have to remember it's an ongoing process. You're not going to organize it and think, okay, well, that job's done. It's not like painting a bathroom where you have to do it another 10 years. You have to, if you keep piling stuff in it after you've cleaned it out, you're going to be back to where you are, where you started. So to keep it clean, just, you know, make sure you're not adding anything to the, whether it is a closet, get some organizers if you need to buy or build some organizers and then just try to maintain it. I mean, that's the only, that's the only way I've been able to, park two cars in our garage Mm -hmm. is by not every time i start loading it up i realize well it's only a matter of time till i'm parking outside so um you know start purging whenever you can and it really can feel very overwhelming when you go out and whether it's a garage or or you know a closet that you've neglected or whatever but boy i tell you what just wade into it just just tell just psych yourself up and say i'm gonna give it 15 minutes and see how it goes By the time that 15 minutes is up, you're hooked enough that you're going to keep going. And sometimes you're literally wading into it. That's right. Exactly. Because you're up to your hips and stuff. It's time for our podcast question of the week. Hey, we'd love to get your question. You can send it to us at todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. This is uh, Katina uh, sends in a question here. I'm interested in installing crown molding in my bathroom, but I'm not sure if it's wise to do because of all the hot, moist air. What do you think? You know, that's Joe, that's a pretty good question there. First of all, the uh, short answer is no problem whatsoever if you do it right. A couple things to think about is make sure you have proper ventilation. You want to make sure you're moving that hot, moist air out every single time that you're taking a shower or a bath. You want to make sure you turn it on and leave it on at least 10 minutes after you complete the shower to make sure you're getting all that hot, moist air out of there. But installing crown molding, uh, Joe, um, first of all, 
I'm a big fan of it. Um, it always enhances any area that you put it in, particularly a smaller area like a bathroom. Choosing the right size so that it just looks right in there. You don't want too big or too small. But, um, you know, there's a lot of the solid vinyl material that's available that looks pretty darn good that will not expand and contract. But just like I know you're a big fan if you're talking about putting on deck boards or siding to stain or prime all sides, even the sides you won't see, I think that's a, a crown molding in a bathroom if you're using wood is another good time to make sure that everything is encapsulated. Yeah, regardless of when you're installing crown molding or any trim, really, I always prime it and paint it before you install it. Even if you have to then come and touch it up, you've got 99% of the work done as far as the finish of the piece. But yeah, you could certainly install it in a crown molding, and she's right to be concerned about the hot, hot moist air. Um, so I would not use MDF, medium density fiberboard. You can get in moldings, but they swell, they absorb moisture, and they swell, and so I would not use that. But I would use either wood, again, primed and painted, um, but if you can afford and move up to the next best thing would be polyurethane molding. It's basically foam, rigid foam, and that is impervious to almost everything. Some of it comes pre-finished, and the problem is it's a little expensive. The standard three and a quarter inch crown, eight foot long was $20. There's a company called Focal Point that makes one. There's another company called, I think it's Akina, E-K-E-N-A. And Fipon. Right, of course, Fipon. So it's readily available. You can find it at Home Depot. Again, but in a bathroom, it's relatively small, I suspect, so maybe cost won't be that much of an issue. Yeah, that, that's great. Katina, and if you need some tips on how to cut it properly, then you can go to todayshomeowner.com, and we've got plenty of videos and instructional uh, articles there to show you exactly how to do that. We appreciate that question. And again, if you'd like to send us one, it's pretty easy, todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. And as always, thank you so much for all the great reviews and sharing with your friends and so forth about the Today's Homeowner podcast. We have a lot to, to, to share with you as we move through this year. And if we can uh, feature a particular subject that you're looking for, go ahead and send that to us again at todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. I'm Danny Lippard, along with my buddy Joe Truini. Thanks so much for listening to this Today's Homeowner podcast.